an atomic transaction is a transaction that have all the rights that it makes considered as a unit of work, which means that all the rights should happen or none of it should happen. You know, so if, if the transaction crashed in the middle, you know, and you wrote half of these changes, these changes should be removed from the database. Nobody should see half of this effectively. This, this, this creates the concept of an atom which cannot be split, which obviously is now no longer true because there is nuclear fission, right? But that's the idea of atomic transactions. Uh, and this is happening. This is possible because the transaction is running in a single process or multiple processes that are coordinated in one machine with the one resource or many resources. We have a RAM, we have locks in place, we have semaphores, and everything is tucked in into one unit machine that I can control. That's why I was able to do that, right? Atomicity, if you will. No? And, and I can detect that because if, if the transaction crashes in the middle of the uh, of me writing changes, obviously during the crash, the database will not be able to remove anything or roll back. It won't have time. Like what, what happened if you pull the power plug? It's not like, oh, wait, I'm about to crash. Let me clean up. No, no databases does that. Uh, what, what, what databases do is like upon recovery, they will detect that this transaction wrote is the state of this transaction was not committed. And as a result, by default, rollback. That's the contract. If you happen to have a crash in a transaction middleware, right? It will be rolled back upon respawn, right? And obviously, some databases do it differently, right? Uh, SQL Server and I believe MySQL does it on reboot. As the database starts, it just cleans up everything. It goes to the undo uh, log, crack open the old state, and persist it to the data files, and make sure everything is as hanky dory as they say. And uh, and starts up. Postgres does it differently. You know, Postgres doesn't don't care. So, so let it start. Let the database start as fast as it can. But then later, transactions know not to read junk data because there is a bit in the row that tags the transaction ID. Every row you write, there is a transaction bit. It says, okay, this is the transaction ID that wrote or updated or deleted this row. And as a result, the transaction that is reading is responsible to check the state of that transaction and it will know that it's not committed, so it won't read it. Later, Postgres does a vacuum to clean up all that junk. So that's we know that what an atomic transaction is. We know how it works. But what happens? If the states and the data that I'm changing are completely different machines, completely different databases, not even the same database, how do I ensure atomicity? <laughs> now, this is a big problem, right? It comes back to the idea of consistency and a the cap theorem that we talked about. Right? The moment you have a partitioning, right, in your database, then there is no longer guarantees consistency. You cannot get guarantee consistency. You're going to get eventual consistency, but that's pretty much it. That because you're now sub physically separating that, and there is a, so there is a link that tolerable for failure. There is a possibility of a failure. Now, you might say, okay, let, let's think about this. How about if I'm going to do a distributed transaction? This is the topic of today, right? This video. I'm going to do a distributed transaction. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a coordinator, another machine that has no data. You just coordinate two databases. Uh, this database will have, I don't know, part of the atomic transaction and the other one will have the other part, right? Let's say we're debiting one account, we're crediting the other account. That's an atomic transaction. You better do the same two of them at the same time, right? You cannot credit one account and not debit the other one, right? Otherwise, you're going to have money flowing in the air. Uh, so, so if I have two databases and I, as a coordinator, says, okay, hey, hey transaction, uh, start a transaction, start a transaction, right? And then go. Whenever you're done, commit. It's just like, you, you can do this, like, oh, go, commit. 
And then when you do that, what happens if this transaction continues and then commits and this transaction continues and it fails, it crashes? What happens? That is a commit. That is a rollback by definition. So the database, when it comes back, what will happen? The database will detect, hey, transaction failed mid, mid state, roll back. And then this transaction has committed. You no longer have atomicity. That's a problem. And you can work around that. You can build, definitely build logic that solves some of these problems. But you're going to have to write a lot of code, obviously. But that's where people start thinking about protocols to solve this problem. Not perfect by any means. Because I don't believe there is a perfect distributed algorithm. Right? Distributed transaction for atomicity. I don't believe so. I might be wrong. But one of the algorithms that I want to talk about is called two-phase commit. And the pretty idea behind this is, what if we built a feature to the database that says, hey, you have a running transaction, you make all these changes. I don't want you to commit, but I want you to prepare this transaction for committing or for rollback. So what does that mean? It means that when you prepare that transaction, I want you to flush all the changes to disk. Anything yet you did, write it to disk, write it, right? You might say, what? That's saying that's just a commit. No, 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 no. Flushing to the disk doesn't usually mean commit because you can flush everything to disk and then flush also the state of the transaction saying that, hey, by the way, this is still running or this is a prepared transaction so that you can tell other transactions that are running not to treat this as a committed transaction. Why were we doing this? We're doing this, that, that means if I prepare a transaction and I flush it to disk, right, with a state as a prepared, if that database crashed after the preparation, the database will come back and say, oh, I have a prepared transaction. Let me restore it back in memory. Let me acquire all the locks because we talked about this in my database course. If a transaction starts changing, it immediately starts obtaining locks. So if I change the row, it obtains an exclusive lock on that row, assuming pessimistic con concurrency control here, right? And then uh, some databases even will obtain multiple locks based on something called lock escalation. If, hey, I'm changing, a, I'm touching a lot of rows, that's a lot of memory being maintained in memory locks. So let's just, let's just, uh, let's just obtain a one page lock or one table lock because, hey, uh, chances that uh, uh, the the whole tables will be touched is high, so let's let's just touch the whole table. Let's just block the whole thing. So though these locks are re-established upon restart, and the transaction is now running. So prepare transactions come back to life, if you will. So that's the feature that that is necessary to us. What if we have, if we have that feature? Let's assume we have that. Okay. Now, this protocol, this two-phase commits, have the coordinator go into two phases. The first phase is to actually talk to all these nodes and says, hey, guys, you guys, I know all of you have some started transactions, but now what I want you to do is prepare, 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 prepare. This is called also the voting stage. It's like, hey, vote, vote, vote. Are you guys ready? Everybody's ready? Hey. Oh, everybody's good? All right. So this database will say, I prepared. I vote yes. Uh, I think my situation is good. This database will say, ah, I'm not ready yet because I still have few changes to do. Uh, I'll block you, coordinator, for a while. Let me change. I I'll respond in a while. All right. And then the database will say, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. This database comes back and says, okay, I changed everything. And now I vote yes. So if all of those guys voted yes, that means all their prepared transactions are flushed to disk. And in case of a failure, we're good. In that best case scenario, because nothing is perfect again, the coordinator will come back and says, all right, since everybody voted yes, I think it's safe to commit. So it decides based on some logic to commit or to roll back. Let's say we decided to commit. So now we tell back all these transactions to say, hey, hey, you prepare that transaction? 
I want you to commit that transaction. You might say, Hussein, how do you know which, what, what if I have thousand prepared transactions? Ah, this is what, something I forgot to mention. When you prepare a transaction, you give it a name, a unique name. So that name will be transferred to the coordinator and the coordinator will use them. Hey, commit, transa commit prepare transaction foo, commit foo, commit foo, commit foo, commit foo. So now all of these guys will commit, 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 commit. Transaction will receive, the coordinator will receive all of the commits. You're good to go. All right. Let's take one possible failure. So what happened if the coordinator talked to all these machines, databases, and say, okay, prepare, 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 prepare. And they all voted yes. All good. And then after they voted yes, the coordinator took a sweet time to actually respond back to what, what those databases should do. And one of them crashed. Now the coordinator says, okay, uh, guys, I think we should commit. Go ahead and commit, go ahead and commit, go ahead and commit, go ahead and commit. So these databases will say, okay, I committed, I committed, I committed, but this database was offline, right? So it never received the request to commit. What are we going to do? The coordinator will, in this case, will say, okay, I guess one node didn't respond Let's just wait, right? So now you have three databases that are committed while one unknown state. Let's, for the sake of example, that that database comes back to life and says, hey, oh, what happened? I was in a coma. The database come back online and says, all right, I have this beautiful prepared transaction. What should I do with it? Let me, let me, let me do my job. Let me put it in memory. Let me acquire all the locks, right? And then uh, do my thing. I said, wait a minute. This prepared transaction, uh, like who was my coordinator again for this one? So it needs to talk back to the coordinator because it went offline, right? This kind of indicate that you should have logic to link the coordinator to the prepared transaction. So nothing is free. You got to have to write all this code. We're just talking about the protocol here, right? And now... The database will talk back to the coordinator. Hey, by the way, coordinator, I was offline for a while, uh, and this transaction, uh, what should I do with it? D did you give me uh, an answer? Oh, yeah, yeah, this, please go ahead and commit that. So the database will commit that, and as a result, you get eventually into a consistent state. That's the word eventually consistent. The moment you break down your sharded databases, you have eventual consistency, consistency, right? It's very, very hard to have strong consistency unless in the very certain situations, right? Where you have very strong guarantees about these situations, right? Very, very hard to do. But now let's talk about the bad things and the limitations of the two phase commits. Right? So we talked about two-phase commit. Voting stage, prepare, 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 prepare. The second stage, either commit or roll back. Right? The bad thing about the two-phase commit protocol is that it's not perfect like any other distributed protocol. Like what happened if the leader dies? If the leader dies, all bets are off, right? Because those databases will have prepared transactions that are sitting there acquiring locks and preventing other transactions from writing, even sometimes blocking from reads in certain situations. And that's bad. That's absolutely bad, right? Uh, and there is no known solution to this except working around it manually, I guess. Or you can write certain code because what happened if if the, uh, if the leader dies and another leader is elected, that new leader knows nothing about the state of these transactions, right? You can obviously transfer the state and you can work around it, work about all these situations, but it's not easy, right? So that's why some people are fine with the two-phase uh, protocol, two-phase uh, commit protocol. And they say, okay, if the leader fail, sure, that edge case, if that happened, I'll take I'll take the hit, right? I'm okay with it. I'm gonna solve it with perhaps a timeout. You know, I'll treat all the transactions as rollback. Uh, that's why uh, microservices uh, Saga's architecture, you know, comes into the place and tries to resolve this post the fact, 
you know, uh, tries to version every right, you know, and tries to check the consistency. So, okay, are we consistent? Anything happened? Anything bad happens? And obviously, I'm not an expert in distributed transactions or distributed processing at all, you know, but this is just from my personal readings. Uh, leave the question to you. What do you guys think? Did you use these protocols? Uh, are you in working with one of these big companies like Google, working on a spanner and, and you know, uh, Amazon, what's that database called? DynamoDB. They they do these things on a daily basis. And believe me, it's it's not easy, obviously, working with distributed because of this networking aspect of this. There's failure and there's a chance that your message doesn't arrive. And if it doesn't arrive, things can go wrong. Things that is no longer true no not true in a single box you know when you send a message to a process it will 100 percent arrive unless something happens and if something happens to that machine the whole thing dies you know it's just one box right so it's rarely a problem in a single instance while the moment you separate them in a network that may fail there is a latency there is a delay and that as a result causes these problems let me know what you guys think Got to see you in the next one. Goodbye.